And now we have uh, uh, Mark. Hello, Mark. How are you? Hi, Dev. Yeah. Morning, yeah. everyone. Yeah. So it's time for the you know all the hard work and deep work you do on the on the state of APIs, right? And banking APIs, actually. I think I'm o almost sure you know all the numbers uh, by memory, right? We, yesterday you were able to to give them directly by then. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's see that flourishing ecosystem. Uh, let's see how uh, how dynamic it is. Uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Please share your screen right now, and you will be able to uh, to share it for. Uh, for other for attendees, uh, yeah, Mark, I'm sure you will share your quarterly reports and where to download it, right? Sure, we'll talk about some of that. Whoa, bit of inception there. Um, okay, yeah, I'll um, definitely talk a little bit about where to find some more information from me. Yep. Perfect, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for your hard work on the, on the for the industry. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Boyd. I use the pronouns he and him. Thanks, Simon, for an amazing keynote to start the day. Oh, boy, I'd, be, I'd hate to be the one who has to follow in his footsteps. Anyway, I'll be talking about the value that open banking APIs are generating now, today in 2020, and pointing out some of the key examples we have in the market, and also drawing your attention to some of the amazing speakers that are part of the API Days event over the next two days. But first, a funny thing happened on the way into API Days London this morning. An API, a bank, and a fintech walked into a bar. The bartender, the bartender said to them, oh, actually, I need to be opening up a bank account at the moment. So, uh, bank, how long would it take me to get a new bank account for my business with you? And the bank tells the bartender, well, you're going to have to close your business during business hours to be able to come to our business, and you have to bring all your paperwork, you fill out some forms, take photocopies, all up it takes about a day. And the bartender says, okay, sure. Then turns to the fintech and says, fintech, how long would it take you to open up a bank account for me? And the fintech says, well, first you need to find us. You, so you put in the right keywords into a search engine. And after all the latest news and so forth, I think we are listed halfway down page seven of the search results. You go to our link, upload your documents. You should be done in about an hour. And the bartender nods and agrees. Okay, that's a bit better. And then the bartender turns to the API and says, API, what about you? And the API replies, give me a minute. And so I want to take a few of your minutes this morning. It's hard when I can't hear your thundering laughter from stand up over Zoom. Um, I'll just assume I've won you over. But the thing is, that reflects some of the benefits of APIs. Instant connections that reduce friction and that speed up uh, innovation. Paul Rowan, veteran API Day speaker and finance advisor to Google Cloud, will be talking more about speed as a differentiator later today. But there are other benefits that can be generated from open banking APIs too. Uh, Naz Red, uh, Redef from Infinite Lambda, for example, will be talking about increasing revenue through data-driven dis, uh, data decision-making. And Shireen Ben-Zayed from Finastre is talking tomorrow about how APIs are creating value in the fintech world. But before we get into my presentation, I do want to thank the rest of my team at Platformable, Thuong Pham, our Open Banking Analyst, and Arjit Mathura, our fin uh, FinTech Specialist. And I'm the writer, analyst, and founder of Platformable. We focus on measuring the value of platforms and creating tools that support participation in the ecosystems. Simon's helped us this morning imagine the art of the possible. I want to help those of us who have been immersed in our own work, those uh, who are new to API days, and those who just want a refresher. Let's look at open bank, uh, where open banking is now and what that says about where it's headed. At the moment of 2020, banks are facing a number of challenges. And as Simon said in his talk with uh, uh, Medi just at the end there, um, you know, how do banks fast track the future? Um, I love that quote. I love that statement he said about um, performance, performative uh, innovation at the moment. And I think we've really seen that over the last few years of API days talking about open banking APIs. So internally here on the left, banks need to digitize and may st many still have outdated legacy infrastructure, but the technology can be solved. The bigger challenges for banks are the, are the courage to embrace a platform mindset and to have leaders in positions that are able to collaborate and imagine new business models. Cohen Adolfs from ABN AMRO, one of the industry's leaders in operationalizing open banking, will be speaking later today on the new sorts of business models that banks need to imagine. 
But once banks have uh, internally prepared themselves to leverage open banking opportunities, they then have to face the outside world where there are macroeconomic issues of COVID. Uh, in a lot of European countries, we're talking about six months now going into lockdown and the small businesses are hurting, but the large tech giants are increasing their power. Uh, the gaffers, I think, uh, uh, was referred to earlier today. And the problem with that is that we all lose if that's the case. Small and medium enterprises or SMEs uh, account for the bulk of all customer base uh, of all of our customer bases. They are the employment generators of the world. They contribute to the greatest benefits. Uh, they contribute the greatest benefits to country GDP, and they are often an opportunity to allow women, migrants, and others to build autonomy and financial independence. So, concentration of power and finances into the tech giants threatens us all. We also have the emerging threats of climate change coming at us on COVID, COVID's heels. It's actually fascinating uh, to see Simon's slides this morning. I think I've got a screenshot here where he talks, uh, where he showed the framework for how embedded finance might rise up through insurance to create value-based pricing for embedded ecosystems. And you could actually see this model um, uh, through the lens of climate change as well. If you look at climate change, it's going to bring in a lot more value-based pricing mechanisms to the market. Um, under a circular economy, for example, we're going to need to be able to price the full cost of products and services uh, and attribute carbon costs. So if we're doing this kind of um, uh, modularized framework, then you're better able to apportion the carbon responsibilities of, uh, 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 to each of the stakeholders. So you can see how embedded finance model driven by open banking API infrastructure will actually help us respond to climate change impacts in the future. Um, and, and with COVID, small businesses are going to need to be able to pay only for services that are actually generating real value. So embedded finance will, finance will help us move to more value-based pricing systems as well. So, but meanwhile, the banks are for, sort of focused on this area on the right here. And, we're see, uh, and they're seeing fintech, the neo banks, and even this embedded software as a service platforms as potential threats. Bizarrely, to my mind, they don't see the tech giants, uh, uh, the, uh, they see the tech giants as a partner to get cosy to. I don't understand what the, what that thinking is about. You know, like really it should be that the banks are seeing themselves and their fintech partners against the tech giants as the opportunity forward. But that's my point of view. Before we look into the trends, let's also quickly agree on this model of the open banking ecosystem. At Platformable, we see that there are five key stakeholders uh, and they are supported by four enablers. We won't have time to dig into this model in depth in this presentation, uh, so I'll touch on a few key components and please um, let's talk uh, after the conference about this. The diamond tiles here are all the stakeholders who benefit from open banking and the hooks are all of the enablers that make it possible. Uh, Isabel Malney from 42 Crunch will be speaking about the security as an enabler uh, uh, later the, uh, as an enabler of open banking and Nick Ledestoika from HSBC will be talking about the importance of API standards later today. So don't miss those talks. But crucial here when you're thinking about your open banking business models is to think about who benefits and how you're going to leverage the enablers. So where are we today? Open banking regulations are increasing around the world. And in some areas like UK, Mexico, Brazil and Indonesia, we are now seeing new open finance regulations emerging, which will give le the legal and policy framework to embedded finance, as well as ensure the consumer protections. So who is benefiting from the global shift to open banking? Uh, <clears throat> let's look at the banks first. Globally, there are now 423 open banking platforms and we count 2,845 open banking API products. That's a growth rate of 269% over this time last year. Here you can see building on that uh, map of the open banking regulations, all corners of the globe are seeing open banking being introduced. It was interesting to hear, the, uh, hear um, uh, Simon be talking about uh, Africa, and you can see that the numbers are fairly low in Africa. What we're seeing from innovation in open banking uh, in those markets is actually it's open finance. It's the payments uh, aggregators and it's the telcos that are actually opening APIs to create these new wave of products. And I think if you look at the Zora example that 
uh, Simon gave, if you look behind that, it's it, it's more than likely going to be, I think, a telco that's doing the mobile payments uh, in API infrastructure for something like that. But overall, even you know, apart from that, the open banking API benefits they they are starting to be realised around the world. And here's some examples. Permata Bank in Indonesia has been able to reach new ta uh, target customer segments that weren't previously comfortable with using the bank services directly. So then by opening their APIs to partners, for example, to a trading app developer and a crowd crowdfunding platform, they, will, they were able to drive new account creation, 375% increase you can see here. So co consumer markets that have previously not used the bank services, now through... Uh, the bank's a account creation API, they're actually, the customers are able to set up the bank account in the actual trading app and in the crowdfunding um, platform. But once the account has been created, the customers also need to move their trading or loan payments in and out of their account, which generates processing fees of which the bank gets a share. So there is a new revenue from increased transaction volume through these third party providers. So in this case, Pomada looked at their business plan, identified target sector demand that they weren't capitalizing on and looked at how they could use APIs to fill that market. In the UK, Starling Bank had a different sort of approach to APIs. Instead of just releasing their own API, which they did do, they also looked at integrating external APIs into their platform so that they can offer a marketplace. This targeted, for example, small businesses. They can offer their small business customer customers apps that can directly integrate into their bank account and help them manage their cash flows, for example, which is a key need in this COVID era. Those partners pay to be on the platform. So Starling were able to grow their platform service revenue from £5,000 uh, two years ago to £1.5 million by November last year. But more than just the new revenue that comes from those platforms, also is the fact that a third of the business customers are now integrating at least one app into their bank account. So that means that those business customers are going to be much more reluctant to change to a new bank provider because to do so, they have to un untangle all of the additional services they're using. Again, Starling looked at customer demand and didn't try to solve or build the products directly for them, but instead created the par partnerships to stream that value to their customers. And here, DBS uh, in Singapore, I think this one comes from API Day's regular speaker, Alan Glickenhaus, who showed this data point at API Day's Helsinki earlier this year. And he was talking about how DBS have been able to establish an API-enabled property marketplace that's generated more than 300 million Singapore dollars in home loan requests within its first 12 months of operations. They use their APIs to start building out new premium products, again, with the marketplace model. So there's all this additional value that can be quantified that's already happening. When we're building out our model to track the different types of value being generated from open banking APIs, we drew on the work of Maria Garcia Luengo from Amadeus, who has been talking about how to measure and track the value of API days at API, uh, APIs at API Day events uh, over the past year or two. Uh, you could also track the value of API days because there's certainly a lot of that. Um, our model is heavily influenced by her presentations. She isn't speaking at, the co at this conference this time, but her colleague, Matteo Pinkave has a presentation coming up on developing communities that will be worth tuning into. Anyway, I know it's too small to read, but on the left-hand side, uh, we've tracked all of the different sorts of value that might be created. So some from revenue growth and operating cost reduction, but, also, but a lot about extending customer reach, product improvements, improving customer retention and so on. And here's just a, sneak, a quick sneak peek of an interactive tool. We'll be releasing a platformable soon where you can choose the location uh, and select the type of value that you would like to be able to see the evidence base for and then click OK. And then you'll be able to see something like the, the list of the different values being generated. Because a lot of the talk we do around APIs and in open banking, we often do talk up the benefits. But what, what, when we need to go back to those uh, bank or fintech or enterprise teams, like we saw with the bank internal issues, uh, uh, like we saw with the internal issues and the need for a platform mindset, we need to have a collection of stories that we can point to that show the value that others have been able to generate. So we hope this tool will be useful for sparking some of those conversations. But what about fintech, uh, you say? How are they benefiting? Basically, when banks 
uh, do embrace a platform mindset. There are four types of relationships they can build. They can start to build with fintech providers. And we see that all of them in varying degrees across the open banking ecosystem. When opening APIs that meet regulatory re regulatory requirements like the PSD2 in um, in Europe or the um, uh, consumer access to data rights in Australia, banks often opt for an open platform approach. So any app user can come along and just start building with these APIs. Actually, the bulk of the users tend to be existing enterprise and business customers who are linking the APIs into their internal systems. But third parties can also build a fintech product, and once they've got it built, they can submit it to the bank and get approval to release uh, to be able to release that. Another model is a partnership approach where a bank like Erst or Commerce Bank in Germany has two tracks for using their APIs. They've got the capacity to open the regulated APIs like the open platforms, um, and, uh, but then they also seek out partnerships with those who are offering non-competitive products. So for example, a subscription-based product like this Sabeo or Mina Technologies now, um, uh, there's a carbon footprint calculator from Infuse. These products that aren't in direct com competition with the bank, but they're adding value to the bank customers. And the fintech being offered are not in the, in the area that the bank's going uh, that the bank's going to be that focused on trying to build internally. Um, and this is some of that innovation again that um, uh, that Simon said that banks were so reticent to look at at the moment. The next model is incubators and acquisitions, and this is where a bank will have a pool of money when that, which they then make available to invited startups to apply for, and then support those fintech through mentoring and coaching to build those innovative products, or they just buy an aggregator or something outright. Um, BBVA used to use this type of model in the past, for example, and at the moment HSBC in Hong Kong is calling for new fintech that they can partner with uh, in the future. And then finally, there's banking as a service. This is getting a lot of traction. There's a lot of interest in this at the moment. Uh, it's, it's already been talked about quite a bit this morning. Um, you can see this a lot in what's happening in the US. Europe's now getting into this as well. Commercial banks have been moving into this in a big way. Um, Nigel Verdon from Rails Bank has tomorrow's first keynote to dig into that model. Uh, and then Hector Arias from BBVA will be talking about the partnership model actually. Actually, we could put that under the incubators. Uh, so you do have some industry players like uh, through Europe, like Solaris Bank, for example, and they package up APIs uh, for services like credit cards so that enterprises can brand their own financial services. And come, customers feel a sense of loyalty to their businesses and want the credit card with their, with their business uh, branding on it. So this will be a huge model underlying embedded finance in future, I believe. But let's look at what fintech are building with uh, open banking APIs and see if they can generate value. Factoroid in the Czech Republic, they connect with the bank's API to offer a small and medium enterprise online invoicing uh, system. They've seen four, 1,400 active connections from small business customers to the invoicing. And they find that by because they connect directly to the bank, those that, they, that do so have a 24% high conversion rate to buying the premium product and they have five less churn rates. So again, that proof of the customer acquisition, and once people are connecting the various services to their bank account, they're much less likely to jump off and switch to other providers. Uh, TradeSafe in South Africa has used the standard bank's APIs. Uh, they've got an escrow service, but for the commodity trading and for mergers and acquisitions. But because they're connected to the bank via the APIs, and actually the bank's now bought a stake in their operations, then as a result, TradeSafe is now able to perform escrow for a much higher transaction amount, which means that they're able to grow their business because of using uh, those bank APIs. And finally, Cake, a, Bel a Belgian app that's now extending out of, across all of Europe, they've had this steady growth because they're, able, they're offering a personal finance management tool that draws in your account transactions. They've got a really neat business model where they share revenue generation with their app users. I love this. So they aggregate all of their app users' transactions accounts, and then they sell that as anonymized spending behavior data to enterprises. And in return, they receive a 50, they do a 50-50 split between their business and all of the app users um, with the revenue that they make. So app users get about four to six euros back a quarter at the moment, I think. And here you can see in euro terms, 
uh, that they're steadily increasing the amount of transaction processing data that they do each month. So which in turn makes them more valuable as a sales proposition to potential enterprise customers who want their aggregated data. data. Um, to finish, I do want to have a quick look at what uh, at whether open banking is benefiting consumers and the underbanked. Are we all actually getting benefits from open banking APIs yet? Uh, there was a question, I think, from Ravi for Simon that were asked about what should regulators do. And one of the issues I think that we've got with the new regulations that are being introduced worldwide is that we don't have good value, uh, value metrics or measuring systems in place to be able to see whether the whole movement to open banking, the movement to open finance, whether or not consumers and the underbanked are actually getting um, benefits out of that. The whole point is not just to enable competition, but for individuals to be able to, and businesses to be able to build their financial health and wellbeing. So when we look at some examples, um, we can actually see that it's making some small differences at the moment. Uh, Holvi, which is now owned by the BBVA, actually, they're a bookkeeping software, and they estimate that sole traders can save about 10 hours a month, which is 120 hours a year or three full working weeks uh, that you can save by using the apps. And there, you know, like if you had a calculation of 25 bucks an hour, then that's about 3,000 bucks. Klarna is a credit service that offers buy now, pay later features. And so they're, what they're finding is that 22% of individual consumers are encouraged by the flexibility payments options that are made available to them through the embedded financial services. It reduces stress. It enables people to plan their budgets for larger purchases rather than have the peaks and troughs in their spending patterns. So that's sort of an improvement around consumer choice and some spending um, opportunities there. And for retailers, the small businesses, if you like, they've seen 30% increases in their orders and 60% increases in their sales volume. And finally, one from Brazil, BX Blue uses uh, bank APIs to offer government subsidised payroll loans that are directly linked to your bank account. You use demonstration of your payroll via your bank account to speed up the load application and approval process, and, for, uh, and then there's a lower capped interest rate as well. Um, just as an aside, the uh, open banking organize, organization in the UK has recently come out with a series of use cases that are interesting. They can't show yet that anyone is actually building products with these use cases, but I do love to see these sorts of thought experiments around what sort of nuanced products fintech could bring to the market. I'm personally, I'm not seeing with open banking that we're seeing this sort of nuanced uh, product that's really driving into a particular niche uh, at the moment. Um, if, but if you uh, are a bank and you think, uh, so, but like, you know, this is one idea around thinking about how you could sort of um, use that sort of ecosystem to think through the sort of different business models that you could bring to market. But don't do this though, if you are a bank um, and you're thinking about business uh, models. The potential of open banking APIs is to be creative and to think through more nuanced revenue share models that split revenue and value creation amongst ecosystem partners. This kind of selling bank packaging for an old school product in an era when we're all going contactless is just lazy thinking. Nothing about a metal credit card says sustainability or innovation. Nothing about it leverages partnerships or enhances customer wealth. Banks don't need to see the banks won't need to see neobanks as a threat if this is what they're doing. So this whirlwind tour of the open banking ecosystem really aimed to show you that generating value is actually quite hard. We have the technology, we just don't often have the creative insight. There are some great opportunities over the course of the next two days to change that, learn from many of the leaders of our industry who are presenting today. Uh, the European Commission is holding a session on public sector innovation. Um, I see Eric Wilde and James Higginbotham are running a workshop and Ellen Ch Helen Child is hosting a governance panel. Take the presentations back to your teams and run mini workshops to imagine what is possible. If you're more internally focused, so this row, and you can you can get copies of the slide deck afterwards, look at what existing products see the highest customer de demand. Look at what open APIs have high transaction calls. Does this tell you anything about what you can build or how you can bundle premium APIs? So cases like Pomada um, and the banking of a, as a service um, examples are inspiration here. 
if you're more partnership orient, uh, oriented, look at what businesses are not in direct competition with you and start talking. Think about offering uh, a marketplace, measure the lifetime value of your customers who buy directly from you versus those that integrate with you. Which customer segment is worth more over your business life? So look to things like Starling Bank and BBVA for inspiration for this approach. Either way, begin or continue in the internal discussions on new business models that open banking is starting to demonstrate and embedded finance will speed up. My rallying cry is, what do we want? New business models, when do we want them? When they have been tested for product market fit and undergone usability research. It will only take a minute to get started. Thanks. And now we're ready for questions. Hello, Mark. Just uh, I was reconnecting uh, for sharing audio and video. Thank you for thank you for the, this talk again. Uh, we we have a few questions, but before before the questions, can you share us with us some let's say numbers at least from your report? Uh, we will push everybody to download it. But uh, you know, like uh, last let's say at quarter one, where we were like like fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred DPI products, something like that. Uh, you know, uh, like two hundred banks. Open Open API platforms. Can you give us a little bit overview of, on, on this? Yeah, sure. So there's so now we're up to we've seen two hundred and sixty nine percent growth. So that's um so now we're up to four hundred and twenty three open banking platforms. At the end of Q one, I think we we're two hundred and ninety three platforms. So even between the end of Q one and Q three, that's an extra hundred and thirty odd that are uh, now opening. Uh, API platforms, and we're seeing growth of the, um, and we're seeing pretty much doubling of the API products. So the the issue, there is some slight issues with counting this sort of stuff. So for example, uh, Standard Chartered has opened up five APIs in each of the countries that they operate in um, Africa. And so then that means that for Africa, we've got a sudden jump of, you know, it's like now um, 28, 30 odd um, APIs for Africa. So that looks like a giant jump, but actually it's standard charter doing five APIs in each of the countries that they operate in. So there's, you know, there's some of those sorts of things. Um, but like when you look overall, you've got things like Asia's got, because of the leadership from the Monetary Authority of Singapore, you've got, uh, which really broke down APIs into granular capabilities. And they said the banks should be um, opening them up in that way, which is really useful for something like banking as a service in the future. Um, but because of that, you see Asia Pacific area uh, and people follow uh, the banks following that model have a lot larger number of API products per bank than Europe, where you've got a lot of banks that are just like, well, PSD2 says we need um, accounts and payments. So that's what we're going to do. You know, and so you've so they've only got like two two APIs per bank, yeah, or three now because they're doing a confirmation of funds API uh, to help with the payment process. But yeah, so you see a lot more innovation as far as what pe people can build in a much more mon modular way in Asia Pacific and even now in um, uh, some areas of Africa than they can in Europe. One question from Dan Fiheni about uh, to your mind, what are the Current differences between you know all these governance and standards standardization organizations like UK OBIE USA FDX Germany Germany's uh, Berlin Group or STAT you know European French STAT uh, uh, program as we move forward into open finance. I think uh, developers need to understand. Uh, I would say the th the two that they really need to understand. One is Berlin Group API standard because that one is seeing a lot of traction globally. So, uh, so the, the, a lot of banks are starting to at least use that as their template to build their API on. So that, um, that's a really useful one to have a look at. And I think I'm really interested in what uh, financial data exchange in the US are doing. US doesn't have a heavy open banking regulatory market. Instead, it's much more about FDX working with industry partners to bring everyone together to drive innovation. And that's uh, and that is actually helping them explode their API standards um, across US and Canada. And you see a lot of uptake and there's a lot more readiness, I think, in the US banks 
they do, because they don't feel like they've been pushed by regulation to have to do this. It's more that they realise that there's a, an opportunity. And as Simon was showing this morning, they get that idea around if we don't do this now, we're going to be left behind. So we need to be starting to think through, you know, platform models um, and new business approach, uh, new business revenue sharing models. Yeah, uh, quick question. Uh, how do you see uh, the role of global card schemes, Visa and MasterCard play in the API economy? Yeah, I think that uh, I think Visa, MasterCard, and the one that I think is really interesting is uh, American Express. Like uh, Amex has just bought Cabbage, which is a small and uh, medium enterprise um, loan provider. And so they've, so they, I feel like Amex has been really clever at realizing that with COVID impacts, travel and all of the loyalty stuff that goes with that, which was a huge part of their business, that's actually going to be on the back burner for a couple of years now. So instead, Amex has bought Cabbage, which gives them the integration hooks to be able to then start working with um, small businesses and re, you know, and, and change some of their their um, business approach to be able to um, support small businesses. You see, um, two of the biggest uh, two of the biggest uh, acquisitions this year was Visa buying Plaid, which is an API aggregation layer, uh, which means that they're then able to connect all of um, the various banks. So they've instantly got this embedded finance model, which is really important because uh, part of I think the driver for embedded finance is because a lot of people don't want to pay the credit card overhead processing fees that they get directly from uh, Visa and MasterCard. So by using open banking um, or using embedded finance options, they're avoiding that. Um, so, But now I think um, uh, the convenience that MasterCard and Visa are trying to build, MasterCard bought fin Finicity, which I think was really clever timing because... Um, uh, Finicity's just done some great work with API Matic, who have helped them build all of their SDKs and been been able to really to drive this sort of developer engagement. And then from there, Mastercard's been able to um, then leverage that those new developer relationships by just acquiring them. And now they're in a, a in a, um, a position to uh, be able to build that out. So distracted by the. Um, yeah, the last question, question. Last question yeah. here. I know the underserved is an important topic, but we have Andre who say that how really can AP, Open API can help the unbanked and the unbanked, uh, underbanked? Uh, if we consider that in most of the time it's more about analyzing the individual and consider that it does not tick the box required to be integrated in the system. Seems that APIs come to make the systems and relationship more agile, but does nothing to include discriminated individuals, right? So I know it's a, it's a topic important for you. Right, so our API is really uh, enabling you know uh, this the, the underbanked to to be really included in the system, or they're just lowering the cost, you know, and the reach to to uh, for them to access to banking. I think that's a really good question, and I like the cynicism of be, of being doubtful of it. And I think this is where the open banking regulators aren't allowing us enough insight into the actual value that's being generated. Um, and like I said, globally, you know, you can't really see who is getting loans, for example. So you can't, from banks, you couldn't see, you know, the number of loans that banks were giving to women-owned businesses or to migrant-owned businesses. So you can't actually identify the structural racism um, and the um, structural sexism that's happening in our uh, established banking systems. And now when we move to um, APIs and embedded finance and uh, and, and um, alternative funding models. Again, the op the open banking and open finance regulators aren't allow aren't enforcing that we need that level of metrics to be able to see whether or not those benefits are capturing. The whole point of open banking was to open up the markets to create those sorts of new choices for people who had previously been locked out from banks. So, but we can't really measure that. Yeah, so I think, you know, like I, I appreciate the cynicism and I think it's important to keep raising it at forums like this and saying, is this real? The tr there is, though, some signs that open banking, or open banking APIs or more so open finance APIs are enabling uh, people to be able to enter into the 
um, banking system that previously hadn't been. I'll give two quick examples. There's a dashboard called cgap.api-dashboard.io, and it's tracking all of the open APIs that are being used to be able to build new financial inclusion products in low and middle income countries. And there's a series of um, uh, uh, case studies and examples on that website that you can look at as well. Um, and then the other one um, that I would point to has just suddenly left my mind. I can't. <laughs> um, the, oh, the other one is Friendly Score in the UK. So what they've been able to do is actually look at, instead of using credit scoring, um, which is a slow uh, process that's part of the, um, uh, part of the larger um, uh, banking system, you know, formal banking system, Friendly Score is able to use an open banking API to look at your account transaction history and then come up with um, the credit worthiness of, based on your actual uh, financial behaviours, which has opened up new opportunities for loan um, approvals for small businesses who previously hadn't been able to prove that they were a credit worthy risk because of their formalised systems, but instead now because they're able to use that. And you'll see that with, you know, so so there are those sorts of examples. Um, the Pomada Bank one um, that I gave also, it's showing that people who weren't in part of the banking system are then now being encouraged into it, not by going to a bank directly, but by coming in through an account creation API that, and, and, uh, that an app that they trust has offered to them. Yeah, thank you, Mark. To know more, so people are asking if you can share some links in the chat of this in stage chat. So don't hesitate to do it. Also, where sure. we can find all of your work, like platformable.com? Platformable.com. So go there. Um, uh, also, ju or just email me at mark at platformable.com. Um, uh, I've put all of the links to the research, uh, research and the analysis that we've done is in my slide deck, and now I'll share that publicly. I'll tweet about that to the API days hashtag uh, and make that available immediately. Yeah, perfect.